Last week I received a comment from my good friend T. Kuhn, the unusual wordsmith, the third over on Manic Expression. That comment was this in regards to my video on the Battle of the Bighorn. He said, this is much more interesting than it was in school. That got me to thinking. She had a teacher who presented the Battle of Little Bighorn and it was boring? How is this possible? It's an infinitely fascinating subject and an interesting historical event and it was presented in a boring fashion? Well, it got me thinking. It got me thinking a lot of the week. And so today I'm going to do a second historical editorial. I did my one on American Exceptionalism and today I'm doing a bit more positive, uplifting one, I feel. Uh, one that is very simply why history. I just wanted you to know where it was coming from and thank T. Kuhn for the comment because it really got me stirred up and so this is what I have to present to you on the subject of why history. Now today class we'll be talking about the American Revolution. Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence and it was signed by the Founding Fathers July 4, 1776. Are there any questions about this material? You'll find it in your book. No? Good. Wait a second, I have a question. Why did Thomas Jefferson write the Declaration of Independence? What were his inspirations for writing the Declaration of Independence? It surely didn't come from nothing. This is a history course, sir. Not a course to ask questions and... You're kidding, right? I mean, you're kidding. You really think that? History is the perfect place to ask questions. Questions are the things we need to make history work. Why would we even study it if we didn't ask questions about it? Unfortunately, far too many people had experiences with my, my friend here when they were in high school. I'm not sure how that's relevant, sir. I, I, I don't see what you're talking about. Now, it might not have been exactly like this for you or exactly this bad in high school, but the point is that far too often history is taught as a very monotone series of facts, series of dates, series of people. Without any blinking information, they teach you on July 4, 1776, the Founding Fathers signed the Declaration of Independence and Thomas Jefferson wrote it. That's it? Well, there's way more to this than that. Take Thomas Jefferson's influences. Uh, John Locke, I've talked about this in the American Revolution video that I did on the lead up to it. John Locke had fundamentally helped change the way we think about government in 1688 during the Glorious Revolution. And Thomas Jefferson actually quotes John Locke in the Declaration of Independence. One of the most famous lines, Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Happiness, is a quotation of Locke, whose prime central principle was Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Property. And it's a little different, but everybody knew what Jefferson was talking about, especially the English. Why would Jefferson quote Locke, an English philosopher? Well, he did it intentionally. He wanted the English to know that the Americans were only asking for what they had already had. Yes, the English got what Locke had proposed philosophically in 1688 with their own glorious revolution. So Jefferson wanted to show the British that he was making an appeal, an appeal to their reason, an appeal to their logic. He wanted to show them they were only asking for what the British already had. The Americans just wanted fair treatment in this instance. They wanted what John Locke had proposed and what was already had there, so Jefferson quoted Locke. And, and the word, why does it go from property to happiness? Well, Jefferson wanted to be more all-inclusive. Locke was talking about those property owners, those with the wealth, those with the, the means to vote and make decisions. Jefferson wanted everybody behind the revolution, so he changed it from property to happiness. Not only that, but Jean-Jacques Rousseau came in there. You probably don't know that name. Rousseau was another philosopher. He wrote a book called The Social Contract, which was very important in the Enlightenment thinking on governments. Uh, this book said it's a, a contract. Government is not something that rolls over people. It is something that everybody agrees to and supports and makes a viable force. It makes the government. It is not something that just comes from nowhere. No, the people have to actually give government the power. They have a social contract. 
for the government to handle civic responsibilities. And so Jefferson, wanting everybody to be included, changed property to happiness. Without these little tidbits, the Declaration loses some of its meaning, and quite frankly, the fact that this might not have been taught in your high school history class is disappointing. Very disappointing. It's leaving out a big chunk of it. And of course, why the Declaration was written? What were the grievances? The Americans were unhappy about representation. Maybe they were a bit paranoid. Maybe they were a bit conspiratorial. Maybe the British didn't handle it that well. Maybe the British weren't quite uh, responsive to their colony as they should have been. I did cover this in my previous video, and I encourage you to go back and look at it. And the fact that we don't link these things together is mind-boggling to me. How do we not treat this as one large thing? How do we not treat it as a narrative? How do we not treat it as the very interesting story that it is? The story of all of us. History has many levels. History is on one hand a grand narrative, and on the other hand it is the story of individuals. Take the outbreak of World War I. On one hand it's one of the grandest narratives of all. Nations building alliances, working against each other, working for each other, eventually going to war because they just can't get out of their own way. An entanglement which leads to a cataclysmic event. On the other hand, the beginning of World War I is the story of two people. Yes, not merely these nations and grand ideas and big alliances and all the largeness of it. It is also the story of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, an uh, outcast in the royal family of Austria-Hungary, the Habsburgs. He's sort of the, the low man on the totem pole, the man who's on the outside in many ways. and He is in line to become the next emperor, but his brother's not real keen on that. So Franz Ferdinand is an interesting individual, and the fact that he stumbled into Sarajevo on that day, well, there's reasons for that too. On the other side of that gun was Gavril Princip. Uh, who was he? Was he just a Serbian nationalist? Did he have any goals? He was a young man still a teenager at the time. Yes, these two individuals also make up the history. It is a grand narrative and a story of individuals. And as you go through World War I, you find more and more individuals. Behind all these grand events, there's almost always the individual story. That's what makes history so interesting. It is a story that builds upon itself from both the small and the large, the micro and the macro. Oftentimes when history is presented, it's presented like this. On a line. Things happening from here to here. The past to the modern day. That's how history is presented. I've always had a little trouble with this analogy. It, it works a little bit when you're just trying to parse out events, but the line, pretty flat when there's events linking to events. Yes, history is not just a line, it's more like a chain. A chain of things happening that link together, moving forward to the present day. And it doesn't just chain here. It chains out into other areas, other places, other things. Let's take that July 4th day, 1776, when Thomas Jefferson with the Declaration. And I told you before, it goes back to Locke. It goes back to the American experience. It goes back to a whole philosophical tradition. There's lots of things to be considered. Governments, empires. If the French and Indian War doesn't happen, this doesn't happen. If the, the founding of the colonies doesn't happen, this doesn't happen. I mean, there's all these events in this chain that lead up to today. History is not self-contained. Events are not self-contained. They are big. They are bold. They are linked to everything else. On this day, July 4, 1776, if you wish to go forward, with your chain and all the links that come for it, you can go right to today. The Civil War. Take the Civil War. America's Civil War. Happened nearly a hundred years after this event. But these chain links take you to it. Without this, there's no this. So how can history be boring? Histories are story. It's my story. It's your story. It's everybody who's watching this story. It's how we got from where we were to where we are and all the reasons for it. History does not necessarily predict the future, but it gives us indications of what will happen because human experiences tend to be cyclical. 
They tend to happen again and again because human behavior happens again and again. And this behavior gives us our chain of events. History has many facets and many ways to look at it. Individual events, individual places, individual times, individual things are alone not that fascinating and hence many people don't get into history back in their high school days because they all they heard were the individual places, the individual things, people dead hundreds of years. But how do these things affect you today? Being able to relate what happened in the past, what happened in the future, up to today is what makes history interesting. When you were younger, you may or may not have been interested in history. You may have not had a good history teacher. You may have, and you just chose to ignore them. Maybe you didn't see these chains, these events that make us who we are today. Regardless, I'm hoping you see the point that I'm making today about history being the story of all of us. It's not just a grand, big story. It's also small. It's all things. So I hope you enjoy this personal and reflective historical perspective.